Hello, uh, my name is Leo Tan and I am the Digital Communications Manager for Turbine. Hi, I'm Hannah Full and I'm a producer uh, for Lord of the Rings Online. And I'm Joe Berry, I'm a senior content designer and I was the lead designer for the Epic Battle System for Homestead. And I'm Leah B. Jackson from IGN and I am about to go on a guided tour of the new Lord of the Rings Online Helm's Deep expansion pack. All right, so we are going to take a close look at a, a brand new system that we are introducing in this update. Um, it's called Epic Battles and specifically we're bringing to life the battle for Helm's Deep. So we're going to wander around the Hornburg a little bit, which is uh, part of the fortress. Um, and so, Joe, while we're wandering around, why don't you tell us a little bit about why we built the system, where we came from? We started on Helm's Deep a little over a year ago, um, kind of looking at what all the story presented, what all we had for expectations, what the movie presented, uh, and what war was like. This is the first time within Lord of the Rings that we have come to flat out open warfare. Um, we've had skirmishes, we've had edge battles. Uh, we've been kind of dancing around the edges, but Helm's Deep is the first time where we have two massive armies that, that collide together. Um, bringing that to life, bringing that feeling, the the chaos, the the insanity, the craziness, um, the the busyness, the amount of actors involved, well, not actors, but the amount of characters involved to create war and to feel war is is a really really large challenge. We didn't want to do um, just classic instances. We didn't want to do skirmishes. We started by looking at what all it would take to, to pull off conflict this huge and what all that needed. And we actually tore down a lot of our instance design and a lot of our, our kind of beliefs and our core tenants completely down beyond the studs to the foundation um, and rebuilt from, from scratch to create this kind of experience. We knew there had to be a ridiculous amount of guys um, you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of the enemy out on the field marching on you. We knew that in order to really pull it off and make it be believable, combat had to be taken to a different level. We had to really focus on our client performance, on our server performance, where it couldn't be just you and three guys fighting over and over again. We, we had to present a, a compelling, a convincing, a dramatically large combat experience in the near view in addition to all this new far view technology that we've done. We also wanted to take and push a lot of our gameplay and what we were doing as far as what uh, what quest completion meant. Um, who's allowed to use objects and how does the usage system work with multiple players and characters? How do those objects interact with the environment uh, and with the, the army that's out there? Um, who gets to play the space and, and how do we um, look at getting as many people in and the accessibility of the, the feature as large as possible. Uh, we wrote new, uh, we, we replaced threat and wrote a new targeting model um, because we noticed very quickly that it looked like six-year-olds playing soccer up on the wall with just this giant rugby scrum moving around and didn't create a very uh, appealing or playable experience. Um, so we've really overhauled a tremendous amount of stuff to be able to support this and bring bring war to life it is a playable experience and put the players in the middle of it. This is so cool walking through the Hornburg. I, I, I'm loving what you guys are explaining, but I'm also having a great time just running through this huge area and kind of really feeling like I'm in Helm's Deep for the first time. I mean, I this is so cool how huge the... Um, the map is and you know I'm playing as a dwarf right now so I just remember in the movies like you know bring me a box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Our, uh, our, our concept artists and our, our world builders really did a, a great job sort of bringing to life the the structure you know the fact that it's sort of Gondorian in origins but has been held by the Rohirrim um, and yeah it's uh there's there's a lot here. <laughs> um, and actually just we we brought you into the world as a, an all-powerful immortal admin. Uh, one of the side effects of that is right now you're glowing red and flashing in and out of existence. If you want to just become like a regular human being but continue, keep all your powers, just type slash cloak into the uh, chat box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there you go. That should be a, that should be a bit better. <laughs> all, right. all right. So we're going to go ahead and um, open up the UI for the Battle for Homes Deep. Um, 
and uh, let's just go ahead and launch one. She can't see that. Oh, okay, so if you want to go ahead and um, I think it's Shift B. Shift B. Well, okay. Um, so this is Jody. Sort of want to talk about the five different spaces that we have. Yeah, we we built a brand new front end um, for how you get into to Epic Battles and Helm's Deep. As much as we're we're changing the play experience within the space and really pushing that, we wanted to look at it as a holistic experience from start to end and that includes how you get into the space and, and before the fighting and the battle and the craziness and also includes after you leave what is that summary um we wanted to make sure that the the, the oreo had cookies on the sides and wasn't just delicious 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 filling um <laughs> so this is this is our, our new front end we, we present a visual map of helm's deep um there's five different spaces the dike the wall uh the deeping coom the glaring caves and the hornberg um, they all have solo duo options. Um, what that means is that it's the, the same space, but it's configured for a solo difficulty, but it allows two people in. We have a tremendously large amount of couples, friends, um, you know, college roommates that play together uh, and want to make sure that they could experience the system and have that, but not get a kick in the shins whenever they, uh, they try to play together. Um, there's also three group size options. The Glittering Caves has a three man, uh, Helm's Dyke has a six man, and the Wall has a 12 man. Um, these are built from scratch to support that group size. They often include much more of the physical space than the solo does. Um, for instance, the solo wall only includes the left third of the wall where the culvert is. The raid opens up the entire thing, um, so it's more than three times larger. Um, and, and wanted to make sure that we were targeting stuff that, that was appropriate difficulty wise with, with challenges of communication and coordination for larger groups, uh, and wasn't just statistical difficulty. It was gameplay difficulty. All right. Okay. So Here right away, I'm <laughs> noticing there are tons of enemies out there. Yeah, we've, um, we've done a lot to push our, our rendering, uh, and our client, um, kind of the performance and, and really what all it can do with the limitation, the limits of that. There's 30,000 orcs on screen standing out there waiting to uh, assault the Hornberg and wow. the Deeping Wall. Um, a year ago, we were in a spot where we could, we could have a couple dozen of those guys and we could really have six to eight in combat. Um, we're now at a place where there's 30,000 of them out there. A couple thousand of them will then march on the actual wall itself. And then when they get there, we have up to 50 guys in combat now that you can directly interact with. Um, so we've really blown the doors off of what our previous numbers were and our previous lim limitations to be able to create something that, that fits and suits the scope and scale that something like Helm's Deep really demands. So we're actually going to feel like we're in a war and not just a teeny tiny battle. That is the entire goal is that, yeah, you feel like, like the enemy army has shown up. You're not fighting you know, an endless stream of two or three guys, you're fighting an actual army. That is neat. So so now we're up here preparing for battle? Yeah, so we're doing a little bit of preparation. As soon as you come in, the space starts, um, and kind of the timer start and the enemy starts marching. Uh, the forces of Isengard do not wait for you to wave a flag or for Aragorn to, uh, to kind of stand up there and, and go, hey, guys, you can, you, you can come fight us now. Um, they, they attack when they are ready to attack on their timetable. Uh, and they're in the midst of now beginning to do so. There's a, uh, an enemy catapult starting to roll forward, flanking him to the left and the right, coming out of the, the army now is a, a couple of enemy formations. Those groups are 100 guys apiece. There are six of them. Um, they will march across the field. The catapult will start shooting shells at you. The enemies will shoot arrows as they get close. When they get to the wall, they'll throw up ladders and grappling hooks and, and start to directly fight you. Uh, you can shoot them with catapults. We have rock drops here that we can trigger to drop them. There's ballistas that we can use to shoot. And anybody that we manage to kill out on the field is a guy that we don't have to fight on the wall. So this isn't just a gimmick. It isn't just trickery. It's actual live gameplay and, and a new what we call the distant battlefield. Um, that's critically important to how the near battle and the battle on the wall plays out. You cannot ignore it. Um, they're right about to hit the wall, uh, and then they will start coming up, and the battle will be joined between them and the, 
the Rohirrim. The player won't immediately get attacked. If you're a tank class, you'll attack, you'll attract a bit more attention than others. Um, but otherwise, the player's kind of left to roam the space how they, they want to um, and choose the moments and locations where they feel that they can provide the largest amount of impact. Um, one of those places, whoop, they're right about to show up. There we uh, go. Up here they come. Uh, And thus the fighting begins. <laughs> um, so one of the uh, the things that we wanted to push on was interactives and how you played with objects, what you could do with them, and what they meant for the space. We've written a brand new usage system. Um, we call it the multi-usage system that allows you to do multiple different actions with an object and allows multiple people to work on the same object. So to the uh, eastern side of the battlefield, on your right, there is a tower. And let's run up there real quick and take a look at our catapult. Yes, the part. <laughs> so what medieval battle would be, uh, would be complete without siege weaponry? In addition to the enemy having a catapult, the players do too. Um, so this is our medium catapult. If you right-click on it, our new multi-usage UI will come up. Oh. And you'll notice there is a bevy of options and things that you can do with it. Um, you can load it, you can crank it, you can aim it, you can upgrade it, you can repair it. If it's on fire, you can extinguish it. There's a lot of different things that, that you can do um, and choose to do. Now, what's interesting about this is Hannah's currently cranking it. If you go ahead and click on the middle button on the left-hand side, aim left. Um, aim left, okay. There we go. Then while Hannah is cranking it and doing that, you can be aiming it. So multiple people can work on the, the objects together oh, um, and do different actions. They can also work on the same action together, where if uh, Hannah wanted to, she could help you aim and you guys would aim twice as fast. Uh, she just shot it and managed to <laughs> kill 15 warriors out of the, uh, <laughs> the back enemy uh, formation there. Which again, that means there's 15 less guys you have to fight in the wall and 15 less guys your Rohirrim need to slog through. Now, how did you see that she killed 15 guys? So if you watch, when you once it's um, aimed, go ahead and hit the top right button. Fire. It looks like a shell flying through the air. Now, if you watch in the distance where the shell goes and lands, when it hits... Boom! Oh, one one. Catap oh, we got a catapult. Yeah, we totally destroyed their catapult. <laughs> nice. No big deal. So there's <laughs> there's feedback both over the end of the enemy formation and over the catapult itself. Okay. Uh, there are rock drops along the wall that you can uh, trigger that will kill the guys below it. Certain spaces have ballistas and different deployable siege weapons that, that you can use to put where you want and utilize how you want. So this system provides a tremendous amount of, of change for how we play and how players get to make decisions and choices about what to do in the space. You can also tip over ladders. You can cut grappling hooks. You can repair flags that have been damaged. There's, there's a tremendous amount of interactives that have been peppered through the space as really important gameplay objects. Um, those are utilized heavily by... Um, our engineers, we've defined three different kind of roles and approaches for epic battles. The engineer is the first one. They use the interactives and use that really heavily and play with those objects. The second one's the commander where, um, or the, excuse me, the officer, where if you actually come back down and find one of the NPCs, the, uh, the Rohirrim commanders, they're towards the back of the wall. Okay. Um, they say awaiting orders on them. Um, and if you right click on them, the multi-usage UI comes up, and there's a whole series of orders that you can give them. Oh. You can tell them to heal their squad, that their squad should deal extra damage, that they should all take their shields out, that they should focus on attacking goblins first instead of orcs. And there's a whole RTS layer of control that's built within the officer role if players want to approach the space that way. Uh, the third role is our vanguard. Um, their advancement focuses on kill streaks and on... Uh, a lot of different effects and bonuses that go as they kill the enemy. And they're built for the guy who just wants to stand there and just stab in the face whatever comes up the ladder. <laughs> now, what if players want to be in the battle and they might... Is there a way to basically kind of set all the commanders and then 
um, kind of set it and forget it, or do they need to constantly be interacting with the commanders throughout the battle if they want to succeed? It um, they're they're going to need to be constantly interacting. Certain orders are um, toggles, telling the guys to take out shields. They'll use shields until you until you tell them to use something else. If you tell a guy to get an armor boost, um, they pretty much get an armor boost for about. 10 to 15 seconds. So those are more, watch what the enemy's doing, watch who's just shown up on the wall, how threatened are your guys, where are their health, and how do you situationally need to respond. Um, it's something that needs to be to be managed. Okay. So this first shot, you can see the gigantic hole that has been blown in, in the wall. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. And the debris and the armor. So um, the story of this space is that the wall is just blown up. The, the Rohirrim have formed up kind of a defensive line around the, the opening, which the enemy will soon start to pour through. And the base idea is that you're trying to buy as much time as possible for the wounded, for the survivors, um, to get supplies out and into the glittering caves in the Hornburg before everything gets overrun. Okay. So while we're waiting for the enemy to march in, um, We'll talk about merit. Um, so the right-hand side of the screen has the the quest journal, and the quest journal looks different for these spaces um, because quests work differently in these spaces. We know what happens with the story. We know the wall blows up. We know they all rush in. We know when Dawn, uh, you know, arrives that Gandalf shows up um, with Urkenbrand, not Aemir. Um, and, and so we... We know the beats of the story. We know the pacing. We know who's winning or losing at any given moment. We even have a pretty good idea of who's alive and who's dead um, and kind of how all that plays out. So we wanted to be able to craft an experience that allowed the players a bit more choice, a bit more freedom, a bit more options as far as what mattered, and that it wasn't just surviving till the wall blew up, or in this case, surviving until everybody could retreat. So we, we introduced the concept of merit, and merit is basically us looking at judging how well did you do on a quest, and how much of that quest did you do. Um, if you think of it at, in a way almost as collateral damage. So we start with the merit bar almost at bronze. Um, and underneath it, it says zero soldiers defeated, zero commanders defeated, zero banners burned, all in red. Gotcha. Every one of those events that happens, we lose points. The further we get into the quest, we gain points. So we're basically judging, we know that we're going to retreat here, but how many of these guys are going to survive to meet the retreat? How many of them are still going to be around? And the more of them that are around, the higher uh, a grade you get, bronze, silver, gold, or platinum, and the better your rewards become. So it's not just about a binary win-lose condition. Um, it's actually how well do you deal with all of these other side things and, and these things that, that are important to the story and important to what the objective are, but don't necessarily mean flat out failure. Okay. That's so. So right now the enemy is coming through this gaping hole. Mm -hmm. And should we be fighting them back? You can be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or our NPCs will kind of do that for us while we do these other objectives. Yep. Um, throughout the space, so these we call the kind of the, the main fronts. Um, and the, the main objective that we have in the main quest up there, the, the Deeping Coom, um, kind of deals with that. Periodically through the space, we will get random objectives and random quests that appear. These also utilize merit. All of the quests, main and random, are dailies. Um, so once you've done them from a day for the day and gotten a uh, gotten graded and gotten a reward, uh, you need to come back tomorrow. Um, but the side objectives require much more of the player's attention to deal with than the main objectives, and they also feed into what the main objectives are score-wise. So one of the ones that can happen in, in this space is there's a whole bunch of buildings to the right-hand side um, that all have supplies in them. And 
uh, the Rohirrim will, will ask for your help to get some of these supplies out, to get some siege schematics, um, to get some food, to get some equipment, and, and actually prevent the enemy from taking and destroying them and get them pulled back to the Glittering Caves so they can be used later. Okay. The more of them that you secure, the more points you get, the higher your merit is, and the better of a reward you end up with. All right, so we just got a secondary quest. Uh... So this actually was, was the, coincidentally, was the one that I was describing. On your radar, you'll notice a couple of uh, indicators that show you where it's happening. Um, and as you follow over, enemies will start to stream through into this area. There's a couple of Rohirrim guards, um, and they'll start to attack the, the storehouses and, and the supplies. Um, and the more of those that, that the player secures and, and covers... Oh. <laughs> so that black powder there that just exploded. <laughs> that um, goes so great for me. <laughs> and so there's different random events like this that, that, that pepper through the spaces. Um, to pull you away from the main battle, it's very intentional. Part of the challenge to the player is how do you manage your resources? There is, this represents, Epic Battles represents a large design shift for us, um, particularly coming from classic instances. There's more in here than you could possibly do. Um, we want to introduce a large degree of choice and options to the player. And there's multiple choices on what to do at any given time. And there's multiple solutions and choices for how to solve any given problem. But you can't do them all. So which ones are tailored for your play style, are tailored for the problem that's being presented? How do you juggle in a case like this? We've pulled you pretty far away from the main action. So how do you balance and juggle being over here and making sure that, that the main front doesn't fall mm -hmm. and really presenting those kind of, of conundrums and dilemmas um, built in within our roles, providing lots of ways to, to get better and to overcome that stuff and to customize your, your approach to it. If an action, so you'll notice when, when, when you click on it up in the top left, the, um, the, the multi-usage UI came up. So if the storehouse is on fire, you can extinguish it. If an if a object only has one usage action, upon clicking on it, you'll immediately perform that action. Oh, I see. So it's basically saying you're trying to put it out, but it's not on fire. Gotcha. Um, we could probably improve the feedback there of that that presentation. So we need to destroy supply crates and or we need to not make sure they don't get destroyed. <laughs> Correct. Anything in red will lose you points. Anything in green will gain you points. Okay. Um, so right now we're not doing fantastic. <laughs> it's more about taking part. <laughs> now what level um, is this content for? What level players? So this is this is level 95 content. It is a cap feature. Um, however, we're, we're kind of flipping the script a little bit. We've introduced a new feature uh, as part of this called character upscaling. And what this means is that once you hit level 10, you can play Helm's Deep and you can participate in epic battles. Um, at level 10, when you come in, everybody who is not 95 will be statistically upscaled and treated as if they are a level 95 character. Um, your damage will go up, your gear will be upgraded, your core stats will be upgraded, your skills will be upgraded, um, and you will be, numbers-wise, the equivalent of a 95. Um, so everybody gets to play the feature. That's great. Yeah, we're, we're excited for what that will do for people who, people who have alts, for kinships that are, that are spread out um, across levels. Uh, you know, for, for couples that may have characters at, at different level ranges, for somebody who's new to the game, uh, Mounted Combat was a very large success for us, and one of the big feedback points was, um, it's awesome and I want to do it, but I need to be level 75. Mm -hmm. uh, or 85? 75. 75. That was last year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we really took that to heart and, and wanted to find a way 
that we could open this up to as many people as possible and, and let as much of the player base see how, I mean, it's such an iconic moment. It's such an iconic battle. It's such a cool thing. Um, and really, it's unlike anything we've ever done. Um, it doesn't unlike make... anything anyone's ever done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That that warms my soul. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a very, very long year. <laughs> well, it's really neat to say the the scale i guess of everything in here and i also like how you can kind of contribute to the fight how you know however you see fit um yeah it's there's a lot of choices like i personally mm -hmm. um like if i were to show you my ui like i i mostly upgrade uh the engineer um traits because that's what I like to do. Like I could load rock drops and kick over ladders and cut down grappling hooks and shoot off ballistas all day. <laughs> I could. <laughs> so speaking of what Hannah just mentioned, actually, if you hit shift B and open that UI back up. Okay. The middle tab promotions. So uh, Epic Battles and Helm's Deep have their own advancement system where as you play quests and as you uh, get bronze, silver, gold on different objectives, you get points to spend in, in our advancement um, that focuses on our different mechanics. So the catapult that we were using earlier, um, you can actually get it so that you, you can aim it 75% faster. Um, you can crank it faster. All of those actions, you can improve uh, the speed of how much you, you contribute to performing them. Um, officers improve how good their orders are and how quickly they can give them. Uh, and then vanguards improve just all of their their kill streak stuff and the boosts and benefits they get from stabbing things in the face. <laughs> um, this adds a lot of life to the system, a lot of longevity to the system, and a lot of depth, where really players get to customize out how they want to approach the spaces, get better at the areas that they're interested, that suit their play styles, um, that maybe target specific. Uh, side objectives that they're having difficulty with, they can shift around, get some advancement to make them better. Um, so the storehouses that we just saw, there's one in the engineer line that improves, um, I'm trying to find where it is, uh, it makes you 150% faster at putting out fires. Okay. So that would be a pretty useful thing with those storehouses. Um, and these um, promotions are only they only work during the battle for Helm's Deep. Correct. Content. This is this is exclusive to the system. Okay. And then, does it cost anything to um, to uh, re re specialize in any of these promotions, or can you just? Oh, it costs a little bit of money. I see. It it, it costs a, a token amount of money, um, a token amount of coin, just enough um, to make you you consider. Um, you know, if, if you, if you want to, but not enough to be an undue burden, um, because players of any level can get in here, it's, it, it's a token cost, um, but not an appreciable one, uh, because there's no value that is suitable for a level 10 and a 95. <laughs> right. That makes sense. The third tab in there is the battle history tab. Okay. Um, this is a... Um, kind of like a re-envisioned deed log for Epic Battles. Um, so this summarizes all of the different spaces and all the different objectives within them and breaks down what your highest earned medal on them is. Oh, nice. If you click on any of them, they'll expand and give a more further breakdown of the different uh, random quests. Um, if you then mouse over any of those, the tooltip information includes... A quest description includes all the merit conditions for that quest and then includes lifetime totals of how many times you've done that quest and what medals you've earned on it. Wow, lots of uh, information. Lots of great information. Thanks. This is, um, this is a really important UI for you know looking forward to how you want to plan out which, which spaces have you done, which ones haven't you, which ones can you get better medals on, um, and kind of a full breakdown of what your, your kind of participation and engagement with the system is and where there are opportunities for you to do better. This is, this is our new wrap-up screen. Um, this is the, the other Oreo cookie. 
<laughs> part of the cookie. Um, so like I said, we, we want to look at the holistic experience. And, and so when you, when you leave uh, an, an epic battle, we give you a wrap-up screen that breaks down the, the main objective, how well you did on that, and what side objectives you saw and how well you did on those. Um, we'll also tell you if you got a new high score. So if the banner's green, that means you got a new high score on an objective. Congratulations. Woo, got a high uh, score. And, and mousing over any of them will give the same tooltip information as before. So this really this really kind of bookends the, the experience from the new map UI up through a summary screen that really makes uh, just kind of a holistic chunk of gameplay. The Glittering Caves River Space we were really excited to be able to make. Uh, they're, they're only touched on a little bit in the book. They're not really shown in the movie. There's there's one or two scenes, but it's, it's more... Um, kind of just brown cave um and there's there's no extensive shots of it so we really looked forward to the opportunity to be able to bring this space to life um gimli speaks quite poetically about the glittering caves gimli gimli loves the glittering <laughs> caves um he actually he and legolas i think come back they do that's true um after the spoiler alert after the ring gets destroyed um <laughs> They what? actually come back to the good thing. Um, so this was another space where we had very, very different challenges, um, rendering and, and visually for how it's described and, and what happens. It's actually, if you, if you look out over the backside, there's a couple of um, light rays coming through the ceiling that actually have kind of the, the glitter and the noise moving through them, which is yeah. something I had actually seen before today. So It's beautiful. Um, this is really a cool spell effect that uh, that's going on back here. So this, this challenges to do a lot of um, dynamic textures, a lot of things that were moving. Um, glitter is a difficult thing in the motion of light and light moving through a space and, and how that causes objects and surfaces to, to react and draw differently and, and play is, is a very difficult thing to do in a, uh, a rendering engine in a video game setting. Um, so we're really proud of what we've been able to pull off in here. And it's also one of my favorite parts about the, the Glittering Caves is it presents such a visual contrast and it's such a different space and a different feel and a different environment from the wall. Mm -hmm. you know, Or from the Demon Room where you're outside and you get the sky and the thunder and the rain and all that kind of stuff and the giant marching army. This is a much more, it's a gorgeous space, but there's a much more solemn tone of women and children and huddled survivors um, and smaller groups of enemies that are um, kind of sneaking their way through, through different openings. And um, you don't get formations of a hundred guys, you get formations of 10 or 15, but there's only five or six defenders. Um, and how that breaks out to a different feeling space and a real different dynamic. Something we've tried to focus a lot through the five different spaces is, is making sure that they have an identity that's all their own. That they don't all feel like they're the same battle, just in a different spot. Um, so in the Glittering Caves, what, um, what is our objective? So our main objective here is uh, Gimli and Gambling have gone off to the east and the west. Um, and they have set up a couple of positions to the right and then to the top. Oh, yeah. okay. um, that need to be manned and need to be to be guarded. Our, our, our main objective here is to, to defend the women and children at all costs. Um, so you can see coming down the ramps is, is our chunks and our, our, our squads of enemies. Um, and then they'll make their way across the bridge and start to fight through Hiram. Uh, be careful how far you venture. Um, it won't kill you, but anybody uh, who's not an admin, the, the enemy archers are, are deadly crack shots. Um, and again, in here, you can set your commander to... Yep. Um, any case where you see... A NPC who has awaiting orders, um, he can be given uh, commands. A lot of times, that's commanders with a group of squad uh, with a squad of uh, soldiers beneath him. 
Sometimes that's a, a foreman who has a group of laborers and a group of Rohirrim who are trying to build a, a defensive structure. And you can actually use the foreman to tell those guys to heal or to boost their defenses or to hurry up and, and, and run faster. Um, so it's, it's fairly situational. There's injured Rohirrim, which you can tell to heal. Um, so anybody that has awaiting orders features that kind of command set. So the Galadian Caves also on this, this kind of front that we're dealing with here, this is Gambling's area. Um, we wind up with a pocket of NPCs down the bottom here, but there's also on the north side of the island, there's another group of NPCs. Okay. Um, this is the middle chunk. So there's actually three. The middle chunk hangs out. Um, they are used for random objectives. But you'll see up here, there's there's another chunk that's that's fighting guys that are coming up this north bridge. Oh, yeah? So right off the bat, we get we have smaller squads, smaller enemy formations, and we also have a degree of distance between where our groups of guys are. Um, so a very different set of, of challenges and choices that are presented to the player than, than in the wall. The epic story will also utilize uh, the Glittering Caves, and there is a landscape version for players to come in and spend some time wandering around and exploring. Oh, good. So we've got another random objective that, that, that has popped up, stalactites over the bridge. Um, so this is another uh, defensive style structure. So uh, that group of NPCs that are, that are in the middle have been engaged. Um, and we have orcs that come to stream through and kind of attack the barricades that are here and attack the supplies. Uh, gambling is up top with a old ballista um, that he is using, and you can actually utilize the if you turn to your right. If you go near to where the bridge is, there's three banners. Um, Towards the bridge. And if you use one of them, you will... Uh, move the signal, and that will trigger Gambling to shoot, and he will fire his ballista, and oh, then sweet. stalactites will come crashing down on the bridge and uh, damage and kill any orcs that are making their way across. Um, so again, trying to use our new... Okay. Um, utilizing our new usage system there, uh, but also looking at ways... You know, again, different ways that how can players interact with the environment and how can they use these objects and, and play with the space in a different way than we've done before. Um, in, in a way that means that, that the wall or the glittering caves, it's not just deco that's, that's around you and it's not just an empty cave network. It, it is something where the, the environment's directly involved with the gameplay itself. This is like a very dynamic, every kind of map is very dynamic and has different elements that... Um... Yep. Yeah, very much so. Um, the random objectives, uh, hence their, their name, are random. Um, spaces have anywhere from four to nine of them that will pop up throughout. Um, they're different for each space. They're each kind of balanced and tuned for how far into the battle they, they are and where in the battle they are. Mm -hmm. um, but no, no two runs will be, will be exactly the same. Uh, one of the really interesting things is we've, I've played the wall dozens and dozens of times on, on my machine at this point, and, and I can stand back and just watch the main battle flow um, as they put up ladders and all the different locations they can put ladders up. And as the AI tries to figure out who it wants to target, the main flow of the battle never plays out the same way twice. Where the guys are, where the Rohirrim are, how it how it flows back and forth. Um, it's almost got, got the feeling of, of water or like a tide to it as the battle shifts around, but it, it's never the same. It's a different visual and a different sequence of events kind of every time through. That's so neat. Especially if you're a big, you know, Lord of the Rings fan, it's so cool to be able to see it play out differently every time because, mm -hmm. you know, you're so used to knowing what happens, like, oh, spoilers, the wall blows up or whatever. And yes, that happens. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, getting to see it happen different ways is just very interesting. And um, I like that a lot. 
when will this be available for um, players? Sure, it's coming out uh, November 18th. And uh, it's free to play? Mm -hmm. It is well. So Battle for Helm's Eve is an expansion. Uh, that means that you will have to buy Battle, uh, uh, you will have to buy Helm's Deep in order to take part in the um, the these epic battles. Uh, but otherwise, the mode um, up to that point, up until level 85, uh, Lord of the Rings Online is free to play.